American Bulldog and Company. My name is Justin McKee, and today is our premiere episode, which is exciting and nervous all at the same time. Uh, and who we brought on first was a longtime friend. Um, <clears throat> we've probably been in dogs at least the same. Julie's probably got a little bit more time than I do on the breeding side of things. Uh, but we're, you know, truly dog enthusiast and, uh, this was going to be an easy conversation for me. So that's where we wanted to start. And, uh, before we get started, I just want to remind anybody who's just listening that everything that's talked about today is just our opinion. Uh, we are not medical professionals and this should, any opinion that we express is not to replace, uh, any advice from your current vet. Uh, anything that we talk about today can be, um, explored further on your own time. You can bring it up with a medical professional and go that route. And that's what we would suggest. So welcome to the show, Julie. Um, Hi, thanks. Julie is with uh, Bingham's Bulldogs, which at this point is now a conglomerate of a couple different breeds. We're going to focus on the American Bulldogs yeah. today. Um, and before we get too deep into your past, I'm going to bring up a story to see if you remember. Uh, and this came up with, yeah, this uh -oh. came up with an interview that I did, which triggered a memory, uh, which is inter interesting, but years ago, before I got into breeding and showing, uh, we were looking for a second pet American bulldog and you had a dog named tank. You were living in like kind of a, a row house wow. kind of situation in Dayton, I'm going to say, and you had a dog named, yeah, yeah you had a dog well. named tank. He had something going on with his hip mm -hmm. and he had a little bit of, uh, uh, I think he had some muscle issues or, or something that was going on with his hip. And you and I probably had like an hour long conversation about him. I think we determined at the time that my mail and your mail were probably not going to get along and we moved in a different direction and we knew each other, not at all at the point. And then come full circle, we ended up yeah. re-meeting again, um, with the dog shows, I think is where we came back around to each other. You, yeah. When you started. I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. so. At a dog show. So did you grow up with dogs? Always. Always. Okay. I Your always parents were them. open to having dogs yeah. and did you have other animals growing up or was it just the dogs? No, no. Dad mm -hmm. hated cats. Well, that. <laughs> we were, we would, we would have like stray cats come and he would, like go so far as to like be really mean to, them, to get them to <laughs> kill away. <laughs> Did we the would dog? Them. Yeah, my uncle had like horses, and we would go to his farm, and I loved it because I get to play with all the different horses and cats, and you know I loved it. But yeah, we always Got had it. a dog. Did Did you guys have working breeds specifically? Were they mutts? Were they just whatever came along? M yeah, all mutts. Okay. And so. Yeah. Then fast forward, you're now a young adult. You decide to get into having your own dogs win. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, when I moved out from my parents' house, I still had okay. mutts. I had like my childhood dog. He was the meanest, like son of a bitch I've ever been around. I didn't realize at the time he was, you know, I was a fur mommy and, he was my baby and, you know, he could bite whoever he wanted. Fair enough. <laughs> and uh, we had cats and, oh my gosh, we had like, I don't even know. I don't even remember. We had like three dogs, four cats. Like we went crazy. And then, um, you know, it wasn't until um, Daryl and I were living together. I don't think we were married yet. And he said he wanted an American Bulldog. And I was like, oh, they're pit bulls and we're not having pit bulls around our kids. And, you know, so and then I started researching because I'm a nerd. So I started researching um, that breed and, and I was like, well, I think it'll be OK. You know, what so year I got my first dog out of the news. What year was that that you guys started looking into the dogs? Um, I think I probably started researching around 2007 okay. and we got him, um, he was born, I know his birthday, December mm -hmm. 21st of 2008 was okay. when he was born. And so I can't tell you what day we got him, but it was maybe like February 
of 2009 is when we went and picked so them up. So back then, yeah. you're talking 2008, seven, you start looking into the dogs. So you obviously had internet at that point. You mm -hmm. could go a little deeper and weren't relying on the old magazines or, or even just books. Um, how did you? I didn't know yeah. anything. I didn't know anything about showing or what I was looking for. I had, we were just getting a, we were just yeah. getting a family pet at that point. How did you, like, how did you end up yeah. deciding on who you were going to get that first dog from? It was in the newspaper and the price <laughs> gotcha. was right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and that dog turned out to be who? Zor. Zor. And Zor was kind of, if I remember yeah. correctly, Zor was kind of your initial heart dog. You, you kind of even, even as yeah. things progressed in your breeding career, you kind of still gravitated to whatever he brought to the table. So do you find that to be, um, yeah. <clears throat> do you think you just got lucky or was it that you put emphasis on him because he was the first? I, I think as, you know, I look back on it now um, with the volume of dogs that we have, I think that he probably excelled more than any other dog because of the time yeah. we put into him. We let him grow into himself. We didn't do anything with that dog until he okay. was five. He was our family beloved pet. He was like, are everything. And, and um, we, we never worked him or anything. We, we went and got a female because we loved him so much. We wanted to ha him to have a baby. Like we were so dumb, but <laughs> so, yeah. So I, that's why I don't get too, um, I don't get too high and mighty on people that don't do things exactly mm -hmm. the right way yeah, because yeah. we didn't, I mean, you know, you have to learn your own path, you know? So, yeah, we, we bred him and we had our first litter. We didn't even know you're supposed to keep something like we just enjoyed the hell out of that litter. Like I adored them. I had them all house broke before they left. Like it was a great experience. Um, but yeah, he, he never did any kind of showing, biting, weight pull, nothing. He was five years old when we it was a whole different dog that we, that put us into right. that world. And then we realized what we had with him, you know, possibly. And then we started trying stuff with him and he just, he just did it. He did anything so we asked at what him. point, how old was Zor when you got the female and what was her name? Storm. Storm. How old was he when you guys decided to move yeah. on to getting another American Bulldog? Um, I think he was, and you got two. her as a pup or she was an adult puppy. Puppy. Yeah. I got her from mm -hmm. Aubrey Gill in Columbus, Indiana. Um, she did a lot of stuff with, uh, she like worked real close mm -hmm. with Glenn Neal that used to put on the Super Bowl. And, um, I talked to her on the phone. I just, you know, we did the whole, did a deposit and waited for her to grow. And then, um, when I went and picked Storm up, I saw her mail that she had got, uh, his name was Nap Town's mm -hmm. Too Short. And that dog was yeah. a freak. Like I had never seen anything like that dog. Now today, I don't know if I ever would have bred to that dog. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like looking it's funny back, cause I, I, know, I did cause... go back and look at his pedigree and, uh, he was actually mm -hmm. three shots of Mufasa uh, in the third generation. So he was, he was yeah. extremely tightly bred. So it was a half brother to half sister out of Mufasa bred back to another Foss <laughs> <laughs> uh, offspring, yeah. which is interesting. You know, I think, I think that was probably like, I should have foreseen how I would be as a breeder from that because I didn't give a crap what yeah. his pedigree was. Like, I literally looked at him and was like, I yeah. want that. Like, I want that dog. Like he was so ripped with muscle. It was like, I mean, it was just like balls yeah. of muscle on muscle on muscle. 
And his temperament was so awesome. Like he would play tug with you. Like he didn't know me from anybody. And I went there and got in the backyard. He would jump in his swimming pool. Like he was so cool. He was such a cool dog. And I was like, man, that's, that's cool that he doesn't even know me. And he's just, you know, so playful and, and he looked like he could just tear your arm yeah. off, you know, but he was, he wasn't big, mm-hmm. tall dog. You know, he was, I mean, probably shorter than what Blackjack yeah. Well, is, and know? Fox, he was, not Fox was dog. notoriously not a tall dog, but, um, if yeah. you go back through and look at some of the stuff down off of Mufasa, that muscle has been the one trend that has carried along mm-hmm. through a lot of dogs, including some of my own stuff that's up close to him. So it's it's interesting mm-hmm. that you would say that he was just muscle on muscle and he's three shots up close oh, to So I mean, it makes sense. The height also mm-hmm. makes sense. And, you know, the other things that kind of come with that dog from my experience are pigment issues and other stuff like that. Um, just more of a cosmetic issue that you can start finding yourself in if you kind of double up or triple up on it. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so now move forward. You've got the two dogs, you've got Zor, you've got Storm. What point do you learn Mm -hmm. about the world of, Hey, let's wait, pull, let's (laughs) let the dog bite somebody. Let's see what's going on. Yeah. Well, we, um, We had an oopsie litter because we were, again, we were idiots. We had no idea what we were doing. And I guess we didn't think our dogs would, you know, do it in the living room. (laughs) So that was our first litter. It was, I mean, we didn't mean to do it. And um, the vet, I had an old farm vet. He's still in practice. I love him to death. And he said, it'll be harder on her to take them. Yeah. Just let her have them, you know? So we did. And, um, you know, we sold all those puppies, great families. I'm still in touch with every single family. And, um, we took storm back to mm-hmm. too short and we had, um, a dog and that litter it was really weird. My husband wanted a bodysuit mm-hmm. dog. Um, and her last puppy, he had come home for lunch while she was delivering them. And he's like, come on girl, can't you give me the bodysuit I want? You know, being funny and shit you not. Number seven was Uh, Spartacus. He was a Brendel bodysuit. So, um, we -hmm. kept him and, uh, unfortunately we lost him. Stupid. Uh, we had somebody that we paid to like do our lawn care and, we had told him, you know, don't come here if it's over 80 degrees, yeah. like you'll kill the dogs. And it's like a hundred degrees and he came in mode. So we never, I had just finished him. It took me three years to it, finish when him. You, when like, you say finish, then, just for everyone to understand, you mean with this champion title? A champ, yeah, yeah confirmation a champion, champion, yeah, champion title. Get his champion title. Correct. Yeah. So we, I mean, we campaigned him for three years. He literally had just turned three and we traveled all over. Like, it wasn't like I just went, you know, a couple hours from me. Like I went to Texas. So I lived in Ohio. So we went to Texas. We went to Chicago. We went to, um, I don't, I don't, we went to Maryland. We went all over the place, Kansas and, um, Florida. I think we went, I think he went to Florida. It all kind of runs together, but we, we campaigned him for three years and, he needed his last major for yeah. like a whole year, but we would, there would just be a dog that was a little bit nicer that yeah. he could, he didn't get it, you know? And, um, I, I remember that's how I met Chris Smith. Cause he's like, um, we were shown against Apollo and he's like, you drove a long way. Do you want me to pull him the last show? And I was like, no, <laughs> I was like offended. I was like, who is this asshole ass? Like if I don't want to pull his dog, yeah. I want to beat yep. his dog. Well, I understand you know? that. <laughs> so we have Chris yeah. and I are super I'm close now. Well. And um yeah, so that's how yeah. I met Chris. <laughs> and um, but and he beat him. He beat him all three shows. And I mean he beat him fair and square. Yeah. Apollo was a great dog. But it finally uh we went to Battle of the Bulls in Chicago, which was mm-hmm. always a good yep. turnout. And um he won, he got a best in show. 
And I actually finished two dogs at that show. Bailey, uh, mm-hmm. that I got from Danny, she finished there. And um, Spartacus finished. So I finished off two dogs at one show. So, but it was like, it just eluded us to get, you know, that first, that first produced champion yes. is special. Yes. I think after that, yeah. it's like, ah, oh, whatever. But, you know, it, I mean, it's always nice to, to, yeah. to get that. So, but, yeah, you, yeah. so, you, so, Spartacus was off of uh, Storm back to, to Too Short. And then, and then right. you, in that time, I'm assuming you start working Zor along the way. You're starting to take him to these shows and do the working events. Yeah. Yeah. Because we started showing mm-hmm. Spartacus. So we started seeing I the gotcha. weight pulls. And I'm going to tell you, my first opinion of a weight pull was I would yeah. never do that to my dog. That was my first opinion. And then we started watching mm-hmm. the iron dog, which in my opinion, um, for the American bulldogs, that's probably one of the best thing that's happened for the breed is having that type of environment, whether it be iron dog or NWA or whatever, something at the shows, you know, to get people to realize yeah. the potential of their dogs, what they can do. Um, anyway, I won't, get on that soapbox, but we, um, we, I forget. I, I was asking you, we when did you start we bringing Zoria? Yeah. yeah. So he was five. We saw the weight pulls and stuff. And so I always go, I guess, to the mm-hmm. people who are doing it and are successful at it to get advice. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not going to ask somebody that's never done it how to do it. So we talked to um, Brian and Melinda Hosfeld, and they told us that there was a young guy in our town that was close to us that had a weight pull track that was training, and his name was Drew Gresham. So we got a hold of Drew, and we went to Drew's garage, and it was cold, as you can imagine. We were like in Carhartts and hats and gloves, ordered harnesses for the dogs. Um, Storm and Spartacus hated it. <laughs> They did not want to do it. They literally were like, nope, you pull it. I'm not doing it. So we stopped. We just didn't make them do it. They didn't enjoy it. And um, Zor, I put him on the track and he literally just got into weight pool form and did it. I mean, I was like, oh my God, you know? So he... Drew's like, that's the dog you want to work with. So we, we did, we worked with him and, um, I'm not going to lie. Me and me and Zor got into some come to Jesus moments, um, during the training where he, you know, he's a spoiled brat at that point. Mm -hmm. He's five-year-old pet and he's spoiled. He's out of shape. He was like 111 or 112 pounds when we started weight pulling and getting him conditioned. I think when we pulled him, he was like yeah. 96 pounds. So a lot of extra weight. He was a big dog too. And um, so we weight pulled him. Um, we went to, I mean, I think we trained him for maybe like two or three months. I mean, my husband, and I would take him to like the park and put the drag sled on him and run hills and put chain on his harness. Like I about killed him one time because I was stupid. I didn't know what I was doing. And um We went to Lance and Lori Falk show in Indianapolis. And that was the first confirmation show I'd ever been to that had over a hundred confirmation dogs. Like usually it'd be like 70, 80, something like that. But they had over a hundred dogs. And back then the ABRA did double points. If you're, if your class had so many dogs, Mm -hmm. you got double points. And, um, we weren't showing though. We didn't really have, um, I don't, I don't know why we didn't show Spartacus. Maybe he was gone by then. I can't remember, but we, um, or maybe we did show him. I just have a bad memory. I'm getting old, but we, I know we weight pulled Zor. Troy was pulling wrecking bull and he had just kind of started pulling him. And Jeremiah Adriano had, um, his pit bull, um, big sexy. (laughs) And 
we didn't even know what we were doing. I really didn't understand the rules. I just knew I couldn't touch him after I let go of him. And it was a card on carpet. And we just, I mean, I just had fun. Like we just had fun with him and um, he did so good. And the next thing I know, it's like the last pull and Zor does it. And then Jeremiah pulls his dog and Drew is like punching my arm. <laughs> and he's like, you won, you effing won. And I was like, what? And he's like, you won, like you beat that dog. And I was like, no way, you know? He's like, yeah, you won. So he beat him on time because he pulled you. it faster. It was like by like a second or something. It was something crazy. Yeah. So I was like in tears, like I had no idea, you know? And then Jeremiah was like, you got a really good dog there. And I was like, holy shit, you know? So then we really started training him. Like, and then we started going all over and competing with him and, I enjoyed it way more than I did the actual sharing yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, because you're, I mean, yeah, you kind of, you know, if you're going to win yeah, or not, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, there's a way to get to the finish line, which is weird because I never got into yeah. weight pulling and it seems to have dwindled off pretty strong. Uh, the, all the shows that we've gone to yeah. uh, for years, there was an option to weight pull. Um, and I think within yeah. everybody's breeding program, it, it, there's a balance. We all know there's a balance. It depends on how many dogs you have, yeah. how much your, what your right. program is geared towards and how much extra time you have. Uh, most of us, you know, are working yeah. at least eight hours a day. You, you come home, you, right. you, you put some time yeah. into your dogs, you've got chores that go into them and then, and then what, you know, I mean, there's only so much time left and then what, yeah. uh, and it depends on where you're at in your life. If you have kids, young kids, school events, all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, there are definitely periods, uh, on the grand wave, I will say of, of breeding that you can invest more time and less time, but going back to what I was thinking about, which is, what value did you find outside of your own personal success that you felt with winning that? What value did you think that it brought to the dog itself? Did you think that the dog enjoyed it, that it, it felt like it had purpose oh, yeah. and, and it, did it get excited to go and do it? Yeah. And I'll tell you, he really was my husband's dog. He was bought for my husband he, he was 100% my husband's dog. But when we started doing the weight pull, he became my dog. Like he wanted to be with me all the time. Like doing the, those activities with them, he, and I, I would never, I would never have a dog do yeah. something that didn't enjoy. It's, it's yeah. not enjoyable for me. Like to make a dog go show that, wants to growl at the judge or to make a dog pull weight that doesn't really want to do it. Like there's no enjoyment in that. And, you know, in weight pull, it's very raw. It's a lot of heart. Like they either want to do it or they don't. And there were times that he didn't want to do it, you know? So he just wouldn't do it. He would flip me off and just sit there and there was nothing I could do to make him do it. You know, you can't like make them do it. They either want to do it or they don't. So for me, um, you know, he had a lot of success in weight pool and, um, lots of tears were shed with that dog winning. And he just, um, he was just really an amazing dog. And then with the weight pool, we, started going to more events it's all like the bite work and stuff so then we progressed into that and to be honest we did that stupid too we did it all backwards like he had no really obedience on him except for you know pet ob yeah. <laughs> obedience yeah. like get over here or you know we didn't have a recall or you know anything like that so we were in chicago doing a we were at a weight pool and Tillman was there and I was like, Hey, do you think you could see if he would be interested in doing that? And he's like, yeah, you know, 20 bucks, I'll try it. You know, 
slipped it, gave him a $20 bill and we went out in the side yard at Karen's and um, he cracked that whip and I don't even know how yeah. I hung on to that dog. Like he went ape shit and he said, let him go. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, let him go. And I did. And he went down there yeah. and bit the sleeve. Like he had absolutely no bite training whatsoever. He just did it. And he, so he said, put him in the hardest hitting. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, put him in it. I was like, okay. So we did. And, um, I think I share the video like every year, maybe twice a year, but he missed. So his first time down, he missed. And I don't know if Tillman was being nice <laughs> and said it was his fault or not, but he said, you know, it's kind of his fault. He sidestepped him too fast or whatever. So he gave him a second chance. And the second time he did it and he like, yeah. I mean, he did good. So yeah, that was, um, that is probably my favorite period of dogs is when, you know, Zor was going to all the events and we were doing hardest hitting. Like he won his um, weight class in the weight pool at Iron Dog Nationals. And then he went out and won the yeah. hardest hitting. And it was hard to win that because we were competing against a standard dog that Heather Charnada had mm -hmm. named Hosta. And that dog was a badass. And them two went at it all the time, you know? So, yeah, it was cool that he yeah. won that. It was it, cool. It, I miss the days of, of really just a lot of dogs and a lot of mm -hmm. different things to watch, whether you were involved with it, with your own dogs or not. Um, right. Yeah, it was so cool to have that avenue to witness that stuff because it was like people like you, they were like, eh, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Maybe, maybe something will turn up. Yeah. And that's how yeah. you figure it out. Yeah. I mean, you don't know until you try it. And I, I think, you know, if, if I've accomplished anything, in the dog world, it's getting people to do a little bit more, I feel like, with their dogs just by, you know, maybe the soft approach of, you know, why don't you just try it and see, you know, if you like it. You know, a lot of people think, oh, if you teach your dog to bite, they're going to be vicious. And really, most of them, it's, they don't even have civil drive. Like, they're not going after the person. It's I a toy fully to them. Agree you know, that, that that's boy it's it's all toy drive like they don't they don't really have you know now spartacus had civil drive he would spit the sleeve out and go after the person yeah but i um, um you know zor was all i used boy. to i would watch the old heinz videos the yard videos and uh they would always talk about the civil drive and the man drive and you know the guy would drop the sleeve in the yard mm -hmm. dogs on the chain and next thing you know it's just it's it's millimeters away from losing a finger um, which yeah. is interesting, yeah. you know, and even for myself and I, I, you know, to speak candidly, I was always intimidated into getting into some of those things, not for maybe the reasons of that. I was concerned that the, the dog would bite somebody, uh, out of confusion later. Mm -hmm. It was just more out of just, I, I don't know where to get started with this thing. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to get involved. Yeah. Is my dog going to perform? And I don't want to go out there and look like a sucker. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I, happened. I think that a lot of people, I think, you know, I can probably segue into health testing with that. You know, we didn't, we didn't do any health testing at all for probably, I don't even know when I did my first one, to be honest, but we, we were always afraid they would mm. fail. Mm. And it's the same thing with working stuff yep. and the health testing. I think people are afraid they're going to fail. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, I'm like such a nerd. I listen to podcasts all the time. So I listen to pure dog talk and they have some really informational podcasts on there. And one of them was like the, I don't know if he's president, CEO, whatever mm. of OFA. And he was talking about, you know, even if a dog gets an OFA fair or whatever, whatever their score is, excellent, fair, whatever, that it's, they're not saying, 
call the dog from your program. They're saying, know where your dog is at and use it as a tool to make a decision what to do with that dog. So for example, I'll be totally transparent here. I have had dogs that got OFA fair, but they had super low pin Mm. hip scores. And I go to a vet. I probably go to the same vet. I think you go. So I had a conversation with him, with Fabio. Fabio was the first older dog I took there. Because usually I take them right when they're at two years old. And we were only doing OFA. And Pat, we passed. I don't think I had any failures at that point. Like when I say failure, I mean. Mild or a mild, mild or worse. OFA yes, mild. Right. Yeah. I never had, um, I hadn't had any that had like mm-hmm. osteoarthritis, which I think people confuse if a dog is mildly dysplastic, that does not mean they have arthritis. It means the actual, you know, hip conformation is not correct up to par. It doesn't mean they have arthritis. So, um, he told me when I took Fabio in, I said, I don't know what to do. This dog's like, he was like six Mm -hmm. or seven years old. And I said, I feel like he's going to have wear on his hips because he's, he's already, halfway through his life, you know? And he said, he said, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a new score for OFA and I'm, I'm getting back hips that I thought would be fair or better. And they're coming back mild. So their scoring is a little bit more strict now. And I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're the OFA, your scoring should be the same all the time. Just because you get a new employee, it shouldn't be stricter. Correct. Right. So at that point, my opinion was, okay, I'm going to use it as a tool because I would never probably pay extra for it for OFA, but I do want to do the elbows. So he charges the same for a pen hip with OFA or without it. So, Right. Yeah, yes and no. I, I know that we both go to the same place. Um, I yeah. think for the OFA, I'm and I don't don't quote me off this, but I think like OFA by itself is like four fifty, and it's like or maybe it's four hundred for OFA and four fifty with OFA and pen hip together. So it, it, yeah, he used to be like one eighty. He used to be one eighty for OFA mm. only. And then 300 for both. And then it was like an extra 15 bucks to do elbows and then like 15 bucks. Cause I always took like five dogs. So he would, it would be like $15 submission fee. So it cost me like an extra 15 bucks or whatever. But anyway, at that point though, I felt like OFA was very subjective and open to interpretation of an opinion. And that didn't leave me feeling like a real warm, fuzzy feeling for, for that. So I prefer a pen hip because it's a measurement. Okay. So let's, let's, let's regress and, for one second. I'm gonna pause you. I don't want you to lose your, your thought, okay. but just so everybody understands that maybe isn't, isn't cued into this stuff and, and as knowledgeable as we are. Um, <laughs> OFA is yeah. a group of three vets after the film is taken, they are basically, um, it, making a score based on the confirmation of the hip structurally within the bone, how the femoral head looks in the Mm -hmm. socket. uh, If there's any wear, if you want to say that, or a lack of structure Um, it's basically looking at a house from the inside or from the outside, trying to determine if it's, good on the inside. I don't know if that's a perfect analogy, but basically they're looking at the overall confirmation of the hip. The pen hip is the amount of laxicity that the hip moves outside of the socket, which I, in my experience, and I have had a dog fail, uh, and I've tested quite a few dogs. Um, Mm -hmm. I've more recently just subsided to doing both OFA and pen hip conjunctively and at the same time. So uh, I could get a direct uh, correlation between the two to see how they actually marry well together. 
And I don't think I haven't had any of them really correlate. I mean, in my experience, I'll get them that the OFA is not great, but the pin hips. And that's fantastic, what I or, that's what I wonder about more so than anything. And th- and and yeah. that is the purpose for this podcast. Um, this is where I want to get a little bit deeper with people like yourself and myself who have done these things for years and see what these little nuances are that, that are really worth value. So when you talk about, okay, OFA is, didn't give you a great score. So they're talking about, oh, based on your hip confirmation, this isn't great. But then Penn Hip's coming back and giving you decent scores and Penn mm-hmm. Hip is saying, albeit right. the confirmation of the hip isn't great, it's performing really well. It's being, it's still tight. So interesting to move forward with this information. I'm curious to see how other people, I have only had results that are congruent with each other. I've only had OFA good with pen hip 0.28, 0.31, you know, and now going back when I only did OFA, I don't know, you know, I've got some Mm -hmm. OFA excellent dogs, which, you know, for a while wasn't the norm to get with an American bulldog. Um, and so I'd be curious now these dogs are, are of well age. So I'd be curious to see, you know, it probably doesn't warrant testing them now, but it'd be cool to see. Now let's go back. Um, you feel like you've covered that where you, where you wanted to leave it. Well, I just want to say, you know, I've had dogs that tested really well that their hips went out when they were Mm, eight or nine years old. So I don't know that, (laughs) you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I am like 1000% sold on if my dog is hip certified, it means it's going to have a nice long, you Mm -hmm. know, hip life. So I just, um, you know, I don't know. I'm a type Mm -hmm. A person, so I'm very statistical. And when I look back, um, you know, like Zor, he was, I never tested him for anything, you know? And, and now if somebody said it to me, I'd be like, oh, you're an idiot, but you know, pull 11,000 pounds. I mean, it's probably okay. (laughs) You know, it was like, (laughs) I mean, that's kind of what our mindset was like, you know, but you can't see inside. I mean, you don't know what's going on because you, you know, you don't know. know. And And I've had people tell me like, they, so I know someone that has a dog that, that failed. It's got osteoarthritis. It's being bred. And, um, you know, someone that doesn't do any health testing said, oh, I wouldn't use that dog. And I said, why not? What well, failed? And I'm like, but you don't know yeah. if yours failed either, you know, but there is, you know, I mean, once you know, you know. Oh. Right. So you don't want to use it because, you know, but if you don't know, then is it, <laughs> you, is it failing? So are you assuming it's passing if you didn't test it? So I don't know. It's, you know, and I think too, like some, I've talked to some breeders that they've tested for so long, then they're like, well, we're going to mm-hmm. skip a generation. Yeah. We feel like we've, you know, tested the hell out of the dogs. Like it's probably okay to skip. And then I've seen like programs that test every single dog religiously and then they're all passing and then they have dogs that don't pass. So I don't know. I know OFA was doing like a, um, a study or something to try to find Mm -hmm. the gene. Like if there was a gene that caused hip dysplasia, I don't know what the outcome of that was. I haven't looked into it, but, um, yeah, that'd be pretty cool if they, if it actually was, cause I, I'm not convinced it's all genetic. So I, wanna, like I think some of it is, you know, environmental. Too, I'd like to so. back you up. There's two things and what you just touched on, we're going to touch on here in the future. So going back when you said that you had dogs that scored all right, and then went on to have hip issues as they got older, was mm-hmm. that only OFA at the time or was it with pen hip? Fabio was OFA mild, no mm-hmm. osteoarthritis. And he was, I don't quote me on this. I think he was a 3230 
or 33 30 i can't remember and he went on to have help he went um, on to have hip issues at 10. Yeah, he was yeah, 10, fair enough. Though. i mean it's mean, it's old for a dog and he also that this is another caveat right like he had to have a mm -hmm. blockage surgery which i think takes a couple years off their life but he was never really completely right after that but that really shouldn't affect his Correct. rear end yeah but you know he got to the point where um you know he couldn't go in and out of the house anymore without mm -hmm. falling or yeah. up or down the steps so his rear his front end was solid and strong it was just as yeah it's end. interesting but and, for me yeah. i guess and i hate to interrupt yeah. but for me what's interesting is to try and determine is it is it the tightness of the joint versus the the confirmation of the joint which one in the long run outweighs the the other and of course pen hip and, and, what's and pen the hip age? true like what's the yeah. age and pen off? hip you know, like, are we talking eight years old? They should live to eight. Right. They should live to 10. They right. should live to yeah, 12. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I don't really know. You know, I mean, we got lucky. Zor lived to be like, he was like two months shy of being yeah, 14. Yeah, that's a good run. Yeah, that's a good you know? run. So let's go. Yeah. So let, and then, let's go back to, yeah, let's go sorry, back. Go I don't want to get sidetracked. <laughs> so let's go back to, you touched on this. And this has always been something in my mind um, from multiple standpoints, from going from evaluating a litter to moving through adulthood, environmental mm -hmm. with hips. What's your take on, yeah. on environmental factors? How much do you think that weighs in to the overall longevity of the hip and B, if you do feel like it is an environmental factor, what do you think those are that negatively affect those hips? So I think when dogs are crated, um, like, you know, inside mm -hmm. wherever in a crate yes. all the time, like for the majority of the day, I feel like that affects it. And it's not just a guess. Like I actually had a dog that he was so lazy now, was he lazy because his hips were shitty and he didn't want to do anything? I don't know. But when I tested him, he had um, moderate osteoarthritis. And he okay. was three years old. So then I was like, oh, well, maybe that's why yeah. he was so lazy. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Which, you know yeah. Car before the horse. So, um, but, but he was a crate dog. He'd been crated like almost his whole life. You know, he would go out to go potty run around the yard, come back mm -hmm. in, go in his crate, yeah. you know? And, um, and, and the truth is that's pretty much how, when you have a high volume of dogs and you have dogs in your house, you have to crate and rotate yes. because they'll kill each other. You know, like you, it's not like, you know, the little dogs, you can have eight of them out at once. And if a fight breaks out, you just start snatching dogs up. Yeah. It's not like that with American bulldogs. So, um, you know, everybody's got to have their turn and, um, my dogs that have been raised like out in the kennels that have 10, 15 foot runs, they usually score better, you know? So I found that my dogs that were, you know, I thought I was doing the best by them, but keeping them in the house and, you know, it's, it's not the case like that they need, I think also the sun. I mean, I think depriving them of sunshine is one thing that affects their bones and their reproductive health. So, you know, people will be like, oh, put them in a kennel is terrible, but it's not. I mean, they get exercise all day. They have, you know, sunshine and, you know, you turn them loose to play and then they, but they can run all day, you know, like they're, they're in this big, area all day so they're not in a 36 inch crate right. or whatever I, I this is an interesting juxtaposition because i have always been known for my dog conditioning um and mm -hmm. just like you said the difference between uh a dog that is on a crate and rotate versus a dog yeah. that's either kenneled or on a chain uh, regardless of what the public persona 
wants to think about those things. Um, those right. dogs are harder muscled, are more hardy, oh, are yeah. just. And I've got some dogs in off my India stuff, which you're you're uh, aware of. All those dogs in a kennel mm -hmm. are just twenty miles a day. I mean, back and forth, back and forth, back mm -hmm. and forth. It was it was in her yeah. blood, and it's in her offspring, and it's in her grand offspring, and. Those dogs, <laughs> as much as I've got to feed them to keep weight on them and as many miles right. as they have on them and their pads are wore down and their fur is thin from running up against the, the fence or the kennel, the amount of hardiness <laughs> in those animals and the way that they test is completely different than a dog that's on crate and rotate. I, I, I love it. Right. To, to highlight that because I don't think that today's mindset with what we'll call a house dog, quote unquote house dog, which we all love to have because you always want to have that guy. You always want to have that big male that's at the house when, when the dude rings the doorbell or somebody knocks that they shouldn't is right there. And it's like, Ooh, yeah, yeah. this isn't my spot. Like I'm not coming in here. Uh, but yeah. those dogs muscle, I've had more of the dogs that I've had on crate and rotate have had more issues a thousand percent than yeah. the dogs that I put in, in a run all day. Um, which is, is why yeah, skin like red feet. Yeah. Red feet, skin issues, like yeah, tear sores, stains. Everything I mean, that comes it, with it. Yeah, everything that comes with it, just the sores, the, just the lack of general muscle. Yeah. And those guys, those dogs get turned out, but I just don't think, that their mindset is what a dog should truly be. If that makes sense. The house dog no. is like, uh, I'm, well, I'm I a... think too, if you, if you, Go think ahead. About, if you think about like, so just to take, for example, like the neurological mm -hmm. stimulation, right? That's like a scientific proven thing, you know, that, it will improve their heart, their lymphatic system, their ability to handle stress and change an environment. If you think about it, a house dog, you know, it goes outside for, I don't know. I mean, even if you're taking the dog for a walk, like you're not going to take like a right. two hour yeah. walk, you know, it, your, your dog is going outside for honestly, let's be honest, probably 10, 15 minutes maybe twice a day mm -hmm. and depending on how many dogs you got, maybe less, you know? Right. And if you have a dog that's outside all the time, so they're fresh air, sunshine, exercise, like you putting them in a crate is almost inhumane, yeah. you know, like I have dogs that have to be inside because of barking and I hate it because I want them to be out. I want them to be outside while I'm at work right. all day, you know, but, um, yeah, I think I think it, we'll touch on this maybe in a different section of this, but I think when you, when anybody gets into dogs uh and you're in a personal relationship it everybody has their own opinion of how it should be done in the house. Uh the kids are obviously mm -hmm. the last to be on record but the, the two adults that have monetary gain in this house or financial stress towards the dogs have a say in the matter. And yeah. um, that's where right. you start to cross lines. And I think that some people think they're doing themselves a service by keeping the dogs on cr crate and rotate. And even if you're trying to bump those numbers up and being, you know, and being, you know, let's say you're being diligent about getting dogs moved around and, getting them rotated and plenty of exercise and attention. And I still don't think that it, it, it outweighs the fact of a free moving space with choice. Obviously you have shelter and all the necessities, but, uh, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, even, even like, I mean, it's the same idea of like rehoming a dog. Like when we retire a dog, you know, you get this, um, you know, animal rights mindset of, oh Giving my God, your dog you away. use yeah. this dog. Yeah. 
it. Well, no, I have yeah. 30 dogs and I want this dog to go yeah. be the only dog and get a hundred percent of the attention, not one thirtieth right. of the attention. So it's like, it's the same thing, you know, if they're out where they're getting plenty of exercise, they have shelter, food and water, dogs don't care. Like they are not humans, they're dogs. If they have their minimum needs met, they're, they're fed and they're loved and they have food, you know, food, water and love, they don't care who's giving it to them. That's, hu yes. that's humans that yes. put that on them, you yeah. know? And yeah, there's a transition period. There's a little bit of stress involved, but I have rehomed, you know, permanently homed plenty of adult dogs and they do absolutely fine. I know what that dog can handle and I find the exact placement yeah. for them. Like I don't just give them to anybody. Yeah. I've, you know? I've struggled. I've Perfect. struggled to uh, the rehoming process of an adult dog is a long-term gain. And, and I couldn't stress that enough when people get into breeding that if you think that just because you're done with the dog in your breeding program, that mm -hmm. it's an easy transition to find a good home, you're fooling yourself. I've spent yeah. two <laughs> upwards yeah. of three years to find perfect homes for yep. dogs as an adult. Um, yes. And dogs, again, that have come out of runs and have had access to the house over the years and then moved into a couch. And yes, the first thing that happens is they're fat and happy and, and they do transition well. Um, and they, and they, and they yeah. recognize a different lifestyle. I'm not going to say it's better for them, but it is probably better for them at their age. Uh, typically as a breeder, when you start to move away from using a dog, uh, you're, you're probably talking five, six, seven years old. And at that point, the dog deserves the, the couch. If you, the, the... Well, and the other thing is you got to remember these dogs have, they're just not been in a kennel their whole life. Like yeah. they've 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 traveled to dog shows a lot of times we rotate too we'll rotate dogs in like as soon as i breed a dog i bring them in they come in as as soon as i breed them they come inside because i raise all my puppies in the house so i need the mom to not be you know pooping and peeing all over her puppies and get them get their heads straight about how to you know go outside to potty and um, so they've been, you know, they are crate trained. They've, they've traveled the shows. You know, if I have a dog that can't travel or I cannot get them house broke, I, they just don't go. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm yeah, too old to I deal with that. that. Right. And like, I, my days of taking 17 dogs to a show are over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> over. Yeah. Let's remind the audience <laughs> that she has taken 17 dogs to a show. Yeah, that's yes. that's just crazy. Couple times, <laughs> done. <laughs> um, yeah. Can we take yeah, a break? Quick break. Do what you got to do. Yep. I'm gonna yes. do the same. 